In July 1926, future crime family boss Vito Genovese was shot in the neck and left for dead. Let's check it out. Welcome to OC Shorts, bringing you detailed historical snapshots of the American Mafia and other organised crime. Feel free to subscribe if you like that sort of thing. Today, we're going to take a quick look at the shooting of Vito Genovese in 1926. Vito Genovese, the future boss of the crime family that still bears his name, was born in Italy on November 21st, 1897. The town of his birth was Risigliano, which is situated about 10 miles outside the city of Naples. Sources indicate that Vito Genovese arrived in New York aboard the SS Taromina on May 23, 1913. He was 15 years old. Vito's first arrest came just four years later in 1917. As we can see from Vito Genovese's FBI file as follows. Vito Genovese was arrested on the 15th of April 1917 for gun possession. Genovese was advised by his lawyers to plead guilty. And as we can see in the FBI file, on the 4th of June 1917, Judge Edwards sentenced Vito to 60 days in the workhouse. This first brush with the law didn't deter the young Vito from pursuing a life of crime and just over one year after being picked up for gun possession, Vito Genovese was arrested again on April 22nd, 1918 on the charge of felonious assault after it was alleged that Vito Genovese had shot a man in Queens. However, on the 30th of April 1918, Judge Conway dismissed the charges. Anthony Di Stefano's book on Genovese would state of this arrest. After surrendering to police with his lawyer present, Genovese was taken to court, where the victim took one look at him and said that the young Italian man wasn't the assailant. The judge threw the case out. Six years later, and now in the Prohibition era of the 1920s, Vito Genovese was again arrested for possessing a firearm on April 25, 1924. This arrest took place on Kenmare and Mott Streets. However, as we can see in the following FBI file, the day after his arrest, Judge Smith dismissed the weapons charge as Vito Genovese had a permit for his gun issued from a justice in Albany, upstate New York. In June 1924, Vito Genovese would receive his first homicide charge. Genovese had been involved in a car accident that resulted in the death of one of the passengers of the car in which Genovese was travelling in. Years later, Vito Genovese himself would recall of the incident, There were four of us in my car. We went to Coney Island to have a little fun, to have a dinner, he said. Coming home, I don't recall the exact time, maybe 11 or 12 o'clock. I was sitting alongside the driver and there were two other fellows in the back seat. We were driving on the street, Prospect Park, and it was raining. All of a sudden, the car skidded and hit a tree. I got thrown off the car about 25, 30 feet. One of the other fellows in the back hit the tree smack and he died right there. Got killed right there, Genovese explained. The police at the time, however, believed that the car crash had happened as a result of a car chase between rival gangsters. Next to the crashed car, the police found two weapons. The Brooklyn Eagle reported, On the ground near the wrecked car, was a revolver and a stiletto. The police charged Vito Genovese and another passenger, Umberto Lombardi, with vehicular homicide and they were both held without bail. As one newspaper reported, an automobile chase, the forcing off the roadway and wrecking of the pursued car, and an unidentified body were the elements of a mystery Brooklyn police were still trying to unravel yesterday. Meanwhile, Vito Genovese, 3873 Water Street, Woodhaven, and Umberto Lombardi, 132 Thompson Street, Manhattan, maintained a stolid silence when they were held without bail on homicide charges yesterday in Flatbush Court. 
The two were arrested after the smash on Tuesday in Prospect Park. Both declare they do not know the identity of the man killed and refuse to relate the circumstances leading up to the crash. Detectives are searching for the owner of the wrecked car. Their theory is that several men pursued the machine occupied by the accused men after a dispute and deliberately ditched it, causing the fatal wreck. Charging Vito Genovese and Umberto Lombardi with vehicular homicide after the car crash may have been a ploy to force the mobsters into coming clean about what really happened. If this was the case, it didn't work, and the homicide charges against Vito Genovese were dismissed. Vito Genovese's criminal record then shows an arrest in January 1925 for being a disorderly person in Hoboken, New Jersey, and then another arrest on July the 25th that year for burglary. Both these charges were dismissed. In October 1925, Vito Genovese would receive his second homicide charge, this time for the murder of Ciro Jerry the Wolf Scotty. Anthony Di Stefano would write of this in his biography on Genovese. It was the night of October the 18th that Scotty, who Long Island police said had an interest in an illegal speakeasy in the city of Long Beach, was shot and killed in Astoria. Police said that Scotty was fired on by four men in an automobile. Four years earlier, at the age of 22, Scotty had also been shot at near the Queensborough Bridge. Police picked up Genovese and in November 1925, he was arraigned on murder charges related to the slaying of Scotty, but in the end, they had to cut him loose again. As we can see, in just over a decade after arriving in America, Vito Genovese had amassed an arrest record which included burglary, homicide and weapon possession. And then, on the 5th of July 1926, Vito Genovese's criminal career nearly came to a permanent end, when he was shot and left for dead in Queens. Mob historian and author N.J. Morgan would write of this in his book, Charlie Lucky, Broadway Gangster. On July the 5th, Vito Genovese was ambushed without a pistol, a block away from his parents' home in the Woodhaven section of Queens. Standing under the elevated train line at 5am, Vito saw a car pick up speed before the occupants began blasting from inside the vehicle. Gunfire reverberated loudly under the large metal framework of the elevated train line as a single bullet tore through his neck, knocking him to the sidewalk. The car quickly raced away. Clasping his bloodied neck, he slowly staggered back to his parents' house before he collapsed unconscious in the hallway. Vito was rushed to the hospital, requiring emergency surgery to remove the bullet and repair the damage. Luckily, the bullet missed, coming within an inch of severing the carotid artery and the larynx. Police were able to trace the trail of blood from the house back to where Vito was shot. The official New York Police Department records would state of this shooting, On July the 5th, 1926, Vito Genovese, white, male, approximately 28 years old, was involved in a shooting and received a single gunshot wound to the neck. The victim's father found his son unconscious lying in a pool of blood in the hall of the family home. The victim has refused to talk at this point. The perpetrators of the attack on Vito Genovese were never discovered, and sources indicate that Vito himself could not identify who was responsible. At the height of the bootlegging wars in Prohibition New York, the list of enemies that the 28-year-old Vito Genovese would have amassed may have been very long. The police themselves believed the shooting of Genovese was related to bootlegging, with one newspaper reporting, Police claim bootleg feud responsible for attack. Interestingly, according to mob historian N.J. Morgan, one of the men who visited Vito Genovese as he recuperated in hospital was a certain Salvatore Lucania, known to the world more commonly as Charlie Luciano. What can be said is that the history of organised crime in New York would have been completely different if that bullet had been an inch in another direction and hit Vito Genovese's carotid artery. 
Anyway, I hope you found that interesting. Thanks for watching.